We just weren't really expecting the weight or something, but we put it in the mayo stand bag and the seam on the bottom of the mayo stand cover split and the leg slid across the floor. And so suddenly we have this leg that we've amputated and now it's sliding across the floor. And I'm like, oh shoot, so sorry. So then we're scrambling to pick it back up and get it wrapped up and get out of the room and not have the surgeon mad at us that we had dropped the slide. Now, you know, it was already been amputated, but still to watch it, fall out of the seam of the bag and go sliding then you have to pick it up it was we were scrambling for a minute but in retrospect it was kind of funny clock in scrub up and join us behind the red line you're listening to first case a perioperative podcast bringing you exciting interviews engaging discussions and innovative solutions that are changing the way patients receive surgical care each episode we talk to frontline staff perioperative leadership and nursing entrepreneurs from across the country as they share their stories experience and expertise on the industry we love from the back table to the boardroom from wheels in to wheels out we tackle the real life issues affecting the or whether you're tuning in for surgical service education or inspiration we're glad you're here and now it's time to roll back and start the first case This week on First Case, we are speaking to our very own Melanie Perry, perioperative clinical manager and co-host here at First Case. And we all are going to get to know Melanie a little bit better in today's episode. And Paul, I'm looking forward to just kind of getting a really comprehensive view of her nursing career, what led her to the operating room, and then also to be an entrepreneur and create the circulating life on Facebook and her blog, and then eventually joining us as we launched first case here. Well, you know, I I was just thinking that Melanie doesn't fit the stereotypical OR nurse personality. What I really like about Melanie is how sweet she is. You know, she's such a low key, mellow, wonderful person And it's amazing that she's able to keep that attitude, even working in the operating room. (laughs) I know so many (laughs) that uh, always had a challenge with that, but no, but really Melanie is, is a, a, a great person. And I'm really looking forward to learning more details about how she got into this wild and crazy business that we call surgery. Well, her award-winning personality is definitely fueled by a great sense of humor, and we're going to hear about that, too. So stay with us. We're going to be right back with Melanie Perry, perioperative clinical manager and co-host of First Case after a short break. I'm Melanie Perry. And I'm Justin Poulin. A 17 Studios production, you're listening to First Case. Joining us now is Melanie Perry, perioperative clinical manager and co-host here on the First Case podcast. And so, Melanie, kind of in line with a episode we did with Paul, talking about Paul and his experiences, we are now doing the same for you. So excited to talk to you today. And I wonder how it will feel to experience an appearance on the show from the guest perspective. Suddenly a little nervous. You know, it's like always been a host, but now (laughs) being a guest, it's a little different perspective, but I'm excited to get to be interviewed. All right. Well, I'll just let Paul ask all the questions. (laughs) Then we'll be good. That'll put you at ease. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, Melanie, I want to kind of kick us off by talking a little bit about how we found you. And, you know, a big part of that was we were looking for somebody who had some experience in social media, obviously somebody who had worked in the operating room. Paul and I were connected through Hank Balch and is the co-host of kind of our proof of concept and flagship podcast, but I would now call our sister podcast beyond clean because Paul and Hank had worked together for many years, but we didn't really know you other than your efforts and work on the circulating life, which is 
a Facebook page and a blog that you have put together. And I thought, why don't we just start there and, and talk a little bit about your story and your foray into social media, and we'll kind of grow that into your operating room experience, and especially in orthopedics, but obviously you've done other things too. Yeah, sure. So the circulating life came into be in my brain a lot sooner than it actually came into existence on the internet, because when I started in the operating room in 2011, I'd been a nurse for nine years, and I was basically a new grad. I mean, deer in the headlights a mile away when it came to what were these words I was hearing? What are these instruments called? What are these procedures? What's going on? I just, I had no clue. I was overwhelmed, didn't know what was going on. And I would look when I would get home, I would look online for maybe somebody else who was talking about what they were going through or somebody else who had been new in the OR and they were sharing maybe something that they had experienced or learned or I mean, honestly, one thing that terrified me more than anything else was prepping. I don't know why I was so afraid of prepping. I was so afraid of doing it wrong. And I wanted to get online and find anybody who was talking about prepping or the right way to do it so that I could do it correctly. And I I just couldn't find what I was looking for. And I couldn't find somebody else that was just another nurse, another OR person talking about their experience. And so that idea kind of sat in the back of my brain for a while. And it just kind of percolated and grew until in 2018, I decided I was going to create what I couldn't find. And so that's how I created The Circulating Life. So how many people are like engaged with The Circulating Life? And what's the mix? I mean, do you have surgeons in there? Is it Surgical techs, nurses, like what's kind of the mix of the the folks that are participating? It is a wide variety. I don't know if I have any surgeons, although I did post a meme the other day um, making fun of new interns, and I got a lot of people slapping my wrist um, <laughs> making fun of the newbies in the OR in July. <laughs> so I might have a few surgeons, and I do have to apologize. I do know that everybody has to learn. I had to learn once too. So i um, kind of you know pushing the boundaries with that one. But I mean, I have people that chime in that are surgical techs, that are OR nurses, people that used to be OR nurses who come to the page just because it's something that they enjoyed and something that they loved and they want to, you know, hang out with with their people and something that they understand and remember from when they worked. I see some sterile processing people in there too. So really, I think it just pulls in the perioperative world from all aspects of the operating, you know, operating room continuum, I guess. So when did you decide to start doing the blog as well? Was that like at the same time you were kind of doing it uh, together? Did one come before the other? How did that all come about? Well, the blog was actually first and learning how to start a blog and how to run a website and do all these things was very difficult and challenging. I the World Wide Web is great to use when you're just being a user, but trying to work behind the scenes and build things can be difficult. But I launched the blog in 2000, in April of 2018 is when I actually hit that button that said go live. And from the blog, I, you know, reading about how to start blogs and what to do, they're like, you have to have a Facebook page. You need to have, you know, Twitter and Instagram and all these other things. And I'm like, well, I guess when I write blog posts, I'll just post my graphics from my blogs on Facebook and see what happens. And suddenly it went from just posting a few graphics and a few things to the Facebook page taking off and really it becoming more of a Facebook Facebook community that grew and grew and grew. And then the blog kind of taking the back seat. and whenever I can post or write something I do, but primarily it's all being run on the forefront in Facebook. So you just described something. You had to sort of teach yourself how to write. You started creating graphics, and so you were doing things like that. Did you have any experience with those things, or was that all self-taught? Because, again, that was one of the other elements of kind of your unique skill set that really stood out was that you had the ability to, to do all of those things independently. Pretty much all self-taught. I am naturally more artistically inclined, but as far as writing and doing graphic design and figuring those things out, I have literally figured it out every step of the way because I did not have any training in any of that beforehand. Wow. I would have thought you were an English minor at least in college because, you know, your writing skills are so <laughs> great. I'd like to take a step back and kind of find out what got you into nursing to be to begin with. 
Was that always your intended Mm, goal is to go into nursing or did you have other goals in mind? Actually, no, I did not intend to go into nursing. I was kind of on the fence. I grew up in a very musically inclined family and all of my siblings sing, play the piano, play an instrument, do something. And I was trained in voice when I was in high school, played the piano from the time I was old enough to sit at a piano. And so I really wanted to go into performance and I wanted to sing and I wanted a degree in voice. Just kind of really thought that was the direction I was going. It's what my family did. It's kind of just seemed normal. And, but when I went to my, talked to my advisor my freshman year in college, it's like, you know, I really think I want to do voice, but you know, nursing is kind of something maybe I'm interested in too. And he said, well, why don't you, you know, it's your freshman year. Why don't you dabble in a little bit of, you know, both. You have to have the basic classes anyway. It's not going to hurt anything if, you know, you decide to go one way or the other. So I took a little bit of voice classes and then I took your general basic classes. And somewhere along the way, I had a revelation that most people who go into voice don't really make a whole lot of money. And I didn't necessarily want to teach voice. And chances are that I would end up being a voice teacher and not necessarily a performer. But at the same time, I was dating my future husband and he was Navy ROTC. And I knew that we would be moving around and going different places once we, if we stayed together and if we got married and I could get a job anywhere as a nurse, couldn't necessarily make it with a voice degree. So I had a, I guess, a stroke of wisdom and thought, you know what, I'm going to do nursing instead. And so I switched and went full force with nursing and ended up getting my bachelor's degree, graduated on time and got married five days after college graduation. So I guess it was a good choice. (laughs) And now you're full circle using (laughs) your voice on the podcast. Right. (laughs) You could have at least tried out for American Idol. Come on, you know, that might've gotten you where you need to go. Uh, Yeah, maybe, maybe so. Or maybe, maybe. I don't know. I don't think I could have stood up to Simon Cowell's (laughs) critiques he would have made me cry i don't think i could do that you're making me want to ask you to sing something while we're doing this podcast <laughs> but i know better to put you on the spot like that <laughs> i sung to a patient in the in the or once i did she was having a problem with anesthesia she wasn't going to sleep she was just fighting they were one two three four about six or seven of us holding her down while they were trying to get her calm down and get her under control and myself and another scrub tech, actually, we just started singing and it kind of helped her focus on something else besides what was going on. And they were able to get her calmed down and get her late, you know, so that they could do her surgery. It was, it was, I don't even remember what we were doing. I just know it was emergent and had to be done. So it was, it was helpful to calm her down and get her where she needed to be. So I've used music in my nursing career a time or two. You know, they say nurses are a jack of all trades and that's like a perfect (laughs) example. Yeah. So you you said that you were outside of the OR for the first nine years of your career. So what areas did you work in and what led you right. to the OR? What made you say, this is where I want to go? That's actually an interesting story because when I was in nursing school, I did my preceptorship my senior year in pediatrics because I really wanted to do pediatrics and that's really where I thought I wanted to be. And I, you know, 12 weeks in pediatrics and it was great. I loved the kids. Sometimes the parents weren't so much fun, but still thought I wanted to do something in the pediatric world. And like I said earlier, I got married right after college graduation and we moved to Monterey, California. And after I got my license and did all of the requirements to be in California and get all that done, I um, got a job at a neonatal ICU and worked in the neonatal ICU for the time that we were in Monterey. Then we got transferred to San Diego and leaving Monterey and going to San Diego, I had a little time to think and I was like, you know, I love the babies. I love the kids, but the conditions I find them in and the, and the parents sometimes make it hard. Maybe that's just, maybe that's not for me. Maybe I want to do something else and we're moving. So now's a good time to try something new. I kind of stayed in that same vein though, and ended up working in OBGYN. I worked in an OBGYN clinic. I worked with a great doctor there and I learned a lot. And I learned a lot about taking care of patients and triage and dealing with, you know, emergent situations on, over the phone and enjoyed it there. But then once again, we're in the Navy, and so we moved. And so then the next time we moved, it's kind of, I think, maybe the flexibility of being a nurse, because every time you move, you can recreate yourself, you can do something different. And if you want to learn something new, you can, because the field of nursing is vast, and it is varied, and there's just a lot of different uh, different things to explore. And 
when we moved, I thought that I would stay in the OBGYN type field and got a job in infertility. I hate infertility. I completely sympathize with the patients who are struggling with infertility and going through that. And they need, they need sympathetic, compassionate, caring people taking care of them. And I genuinely loved our patients, but the practice I was in, the the doc I was working for, we were not a good fit. And I'm like, mm, nope, this is not for me. And I made the decision to go to med surge. And maybe that was not the best choice because med surge is, well, it's med surge. Let's just be honest. Med surge is, mm, it's, it's, it's hard, but it was, it was good because I got to do all of that inpatient nursing care that we all learn about in nursing school that we all get prepared for. And I did that for a while. And when I got the opportunity at the same hospital where I was doing med surge, we were able, we had a pain clinic and I transferred down to the pain clinic to work there. Ended up doing pain management for four, four or five years. But in pain management, we do sterile procedures. We do sterile injections and we do other things that kind of exposed me to a sterile setup, to different procedures and things where we were doing monitored anesthesia care and sedation and whatnot. And then one of the surgeons that would come do pain management was also doing his implants and pain pumps in a surgery center. And he was like, hey, they need nurses. Are you interested? And I'm like, I don't know. Why not? I mean, I really had no idea. I'd never even been in the OR except for two times in nursing school. So I had no idea what to expect. I'm like, yeah, sure. Why not? It's something new. I'm ready for something different. I'll give it a try. And I'm so glad I did because once I did and once I got in the OR and really got my feet under me and figured out what was going on, I realized I loved it. And I did not ever want to have to do this bouncing around, going different places, learning different areas again. This is where I wanted to stay. So I know that after a while you ended up in orthopedics. Right. And yeah. And I know that's kind of your favorite area. So tell me, what is your favorite operation you like to assist in? Where, 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 what brings you the most fun in the OR? What kind of case? Total joints, hands down. I love a total joint. I like to be either scrubbed in or circulating it. I like the hustle and bustle of it. Sometimes revisions are a little much and they can be overwhelming, but still, I just, I enjoy those procedures more than anything else in the OR. They're my favorite. All right, Melanie. So I think it's story time and I want to hear a couple of stories. We'll start with the first one. What is like the funniest thing or the funniest story you have from your time in the operating room? So the most vivid thing that I remember from my time in the OR, I was orthopedic team leader at an academic medical center. The facility that I worked at was the primary total joint outpatient hospital for the academic medical center. We did I'd probably say 60 to 70% of our patients were outpatient or whatnot, but we did get sick patients. We did get patients with other issues. And this particular patient that came in, we were doing a hemipelvectomy. I'd never seen a hemipelvectomy. I mean, they were amputating this person's pelvis all the way down. Everything was getting amputated. The patient had cancer. And so they were having to do a, a massive amputation to save this patient's life. And so all of that is very serious. And I'm not trying to belittle any of that. But I'm standing in the room. I'm not the primary circulator, but I was in the room because this was a sick patient. We're trying to help. And I just wanted to watch. I just had no, no clue what to expect or what was going on. Well, anyway, so the surgeon is operating. It's intense. They they finally get everything amputated and they pass off this specimen that is enormous because it's a hip down to a foot. I mean, it's the whole leg. And we had a ring stand ready with the bag wrapped around it almost like a trash can so we could put the whole limb into it so that we could then get it transported to lab. And when, when the, we took it from the surgeon and we put it into the bag, I guess... We just weren't really expecting the weight or something, but we put it in the mayo stand bag and the seam on the bottom of the mayo stand cover split and the leg slid across the floor. And so suddenly we have this leg that we've amputated and now it's sliding across the floor. And I'm like, oh shoot, so sorry. So then we're scrambling to pick it back up and get it wrapped up and get out of the room and not have the surgeon mad at us that we had dropped this leg. Now, you know, it was already been amputated, but still to watch it fall out of the seam of the bag and go sliding. Then you have to pick it up. It was, we were scrambling for a minute, but in retrospect, it was kind of funny. 
in the moment, it must have been a little nerve wracking. <laughs> yeah, it was. I was you like, know, please that's don't look. like one of those stories where you have to have a sense of humor some days yeah. to get through it. I mean, outside of being a nurse in the operating room, what's the likelihood anybody's going to have that experience? It's zero. Yeah. Nope, never. It's absolutely zero. So, you know, we're faced with some of the most unique situations that, you know, any one human could see, right? Right. So, okay. So that's a rather humorous one. How about something, maybe one of the more difficult situations that came up for you that, I don't know, maybe put you, I don't want to say in a compromising position, but, you know, we hear every, like in nursing school, you hear all about critical thinking, right? And then we wind up in these situations where we're, we're really trying to work through that. And we get our critical thinking put to the test. Can you remember a time where you were really put to the test in that way? We had a couple of different times where we would have, it always seems like emergencies happen after everybody's gone home and you're there late. And, you know, we didn't have an overnight shift. I mean, our shifts ended at seven and after that it was the call team. And then team leaders would typically stay if their rooms were still going. And one of my rooms was going one night and we were doing a total knee. And so I was in the room helping, but then, you know, I'd gone back and forth and was finishing up some of the other stuff that I did. But we had, they called out. Suddenly for help, the patient had gone from being okay to not being okay. And it turned into, you know, here we are eight o'clock at night doing chest compressions on a patient, trying to get, you know, the surgeon's like, do I need to finish? Do I need to close up? We're like, yeah, you need to just close up and be done because we have other issues at hand. And then trying to figure out how do we need to handle this emergency? What do we need to do when we didn't have, you know, upper leadership there? We didn't have people available to really come help us. We didn't have all of the team that we needed. And yet, you know, we still had to code this patient. We still had to do our best to try to get her stable, get her to the ICU. And it was, it was hard and it was difficult to think through in the moment, everything that maybe we should be doing just because it's, chaotic. And in a hospital where you're primarily doing outpatient surgeries, you're not typically coding patients. You're not typically doing chest compressions on a surgical table. And so when you are thinking through all those proper steps, it can be very challenging. So I think maybe the big takeaway, because the story does not end well for this patient, but I think a good takeaway is thinking when it's calm, thinking through those emergency situations, thinking through what you would have to do when you're actually not stressed out about it so that when the situation comes, you've already thought it through so that then you actually know what you would need to do because you've, you've thought about it when you're not stressed out. Yeah. It's almost automatic and you've practiced in your mind and, and visualize that scenario. Did you feel like time sped up or slowed down in that scenario? Maybe a little bit of both because it felt like it was going by so fast and that everything was going in a whirlwind. And then when we finally get it all done and we're, we're cleaning up the room and, it, it was really late and I didn't realize how long it had been. So it, it was just a weird perception of time in the moment. So Melanie, now that you're really doing a lot of other things, being involved with First Case and some of the other media uh, workings of Justin and Hank's empire. Network. <laughs> <laughs> Network. Okay. Do you miss being in the OR? Uh, as much and uh, are you doing anything to get back in at all or how how are you managing that how do you feel about that the absolute honest answer is i miss it terribly i miss being in the environment i miss being around my people i miss the patient care even and now i realize i'm looking back at it with rose colored glasses because i can think of any number of frustrations that would, that drove me nuts on a day in and day out basis, but that, that is just the nature of what we do. And that is the stress. But at the end of the day, I love the operating room. I love the environment and I loved what I did. So yes, I miss it terribly. Actually, even today, I was thinking through different ways that I could get either back in the environment in one way or another. And if I can put a shameless plug into anybody who does medical missions, I would really love to go as an OR circulator on a medical mission trip, because I think that I could really pour myself into that and really get, be able to give back to others, but 
do what I love for a couple of weeks out of the year and really use that to drive what I do with first case. And, but that's kind of where I'm thinking in the future, I can be involved so that I can stay in the operating room, stay in that environment some, and then also do what I do with first case because I really do enjoy it. And I like the education aspect of it because I want the operating room to be a place that patients get great care. And I want the people who work in the operating room to know why they do what they do. And so that's what I think I can help do by being at first case. Well, if you want to pull Melanie in on a mission, just send an email to info at firstcasemedia.com. And then also, Melanie, I'll put a plug in for an organization that we got connected with at Beyond Clean called Mercy Ships, if you haven't I have, heard of them. Yeah. I may have some other options for her for some supplemental work in the near future that hopefully she'll be able to take advantage of. Yeah, we need to talk, Paul. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, Melanie, I'm just kind of uh, wanting to tie this all back up because, as you just mentioned, you know, you've been away for the from the operating room, but not really too no. long, right? Only about right. nine mm -hmm. months now. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, a little bit like that. Yeah. So. Yeah, you haven't been you haven't been gone that long, but you really had been dabbling into to social media for like four yeah. years. So on the flip side of missing the operating room, as we kind of wrap up this interview, what do you love about, you know, social media, everything that you've built at the circulating life, what you've done here at First Case and like the webinars and conferences that you've hosted, like what is the what's the the real big reward for you in this kind of alternative career path that you've taken? I think that what I enjoy the most about social media and about the perioperative community is that instead of when I'm at the hospital, it's me with maybe the 20 or 30 or 40 other people there that I work with in my own little world at the hospital in my department with social media. I can be connected to every perioperative individual around the world. And so I don't have the limiting factor of just the four walls of my hospital. I have the world at my fingertips. And so I, if I have a network of professionals who know the OR, who want to know the OR or have different experiences within the OR, because let's be honest, even the OR is a varied experience. Some people never do transplant, never do cardiothoracic surgery, never do brains. I mean, all these different things that you can do within the OR and be an expert in that some people may not ever see. So we have the opportunity to learn from each other and we have the opportunity to share our own experiences and and build each other up in our community of nursing and other professionals as well that are in the OR. And I just think that you just... I guess maybe the world is your oyster when it comes to what social media can do to bring those benefits of nursing and connect everybody together. All right, Melanie. Well, this was an excellent interview and I think everybody will enjoy getting to know you better. You're really the face of first case as well as the voice <laughs> to bring this even more full circle to prior to your nursing career. And I really enjoyed even hearing a little bit more fleshed out. Like I know we've talked a lot, but this gave me a, like a really full kind of big picture of who is Melanie Perry. And so I really enjoyed it. You are an absolute rock star <laughs> when it comes to everything that you've done. And, you know, you've learned a lot, you know, kind of working with first oh, case sure. too. You already had a lot of experience with marketing, but for those of you out there that don't know, we have a newsletter. You certainly can subscribe to that just by going to firstcasemedia.com. But Melanie puts that whole newsletter together every single week. She writes up all the descriptions for our episodes. I mean, she's really the nuts and bolts behind anything that you read. Or if you did attend our very first perioperative conference, which was 101 back in March, Melanie really did all the legwork for getting that conference going and lining up all the speakers, et cetera. And I know you do a good amount of work on Beyond Clean, so you've been exposed to a ton of sterile processing yes, content yes. in your time mm -hmm. as well. And I'm very appreciative of that. For so, sure. And you've done a fantastic job. So thanks so much for coming on the show. Paul and I are going to talk about you behind your back here. <laughs> okay, well, y'all do that. I'll just tune in later and hear what you said. <laughs> that was Melanie Perry, perioperative clinical manager and co-host here at First Case. And Paul, really... Melanie is the nuts and bolts behind everything here. And as I mentioned earlier, 
the face of First Case, as well as one of the voices of First Case. So it was really great getting to know her a little bit more and letting the audience out there really hear a lot more about, you know, what what brought her to the table? How did we get here? Well, you know, it's been really fun seeing her grow in her role at First Case. I think when, when she first started, she was a little shy to ask questions and also lacked a little confidence. But I see now how much she's grown and how much confidence she has in what she's doing and how great she is at, at it. She's a natural. You know, I, I read her posts on Circulating Life and I love them and all those cartoons and graphics that she does. Just they're so spot on all the time. It's just great. We didn't really talk about this, but, you know, there is a really interesting, you know, place on Facebook in general, and the circulating life is one of those, but those graphics and that humor, as we talked about earlier, like having that sense of humor is so, so important to, uh, I think, just dealing with some of the stress in the operating room environment that um, the circulating life and, and Melanie does a phenomenal job with bringing that humor. And it was definitely a big, a big focus for her. All right. Well, that's going to do it for this week's show. As a reminder, you can help support First Case by subscribing on Apple, Amazon, or Google Podcasts. You can also find us on Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Spotify, or simply search for First Case on your favorite podcast application. We've also got bonus content for some episodes, but you can't get it unless you download our smartphone app for iPhone or Android. And while you're there downloading the app, we'd appreciate a rating and a review because your feedback is important to the show. And speaking of feedback, if you have any recommendations for a guest or a topic on a future episode, we'd love to hear from you. Just send an email to info at firstcasemedia.com. On behalf of Paul, Melanie, and myself, thank you for listening to this week's episode of First Case. First Case.